That was the time. Okay. <laughs> Great. So, okay, a few more colleagues are joining. Okay, so very good morning, everyone, um, to the Solutions Plus Movie Mix workshop on shared e mobility. Um, we'll have uh, quite a nice and interesting program for you this morning and tomorrow. Um, we'll start with a short introduction to the two projects. Um, but first of all, let's have a look into uh, the agenda. So um, uh, in, on both days, we'll uh, go between uh, 9 and 12. We'll have a uh, discussion and also breaks in between. But we would like to share um, quite a nice overview on uh, experiences from, from the two projects on, on shared mobility solutions. Um, maybe just um, a few housekeeping rules before we uh, go ahead. Um, uh, we will have um, the usual that you are uh, very familiar with already, I suppose. So if you have questions, you can either put them in the chat or you're also welcome to raise your hand and pose the question directly to the panel. Um, uh, the session is recorded, will be made available afterwards. And uh, as usual, uh, if you're not talking, uh, kindly mute yourself so that we can keep it nice and quiet over here. Um, and uh, we also have a little poll to get us started. So, Claudia, are you introducing the poll? Yes, here we go. Okay, so um, it, if it's the same for you as it was for me, the little window popped up uh, that poses uh, the first question, uh, does your city operate its own shared e-mobility, uh, or mobility service, sorry, uh, simple yes or no question. And if yes, um, which ones would that be? Bike sharing, car sharing, e-scooter sharing, or other, just to get us started. And we'll see some results popping up. Can I ask you a question, Oliver? Yeah. Because in the poll, it's uh, mentioned e-scooter, and uh, we experienced during our project that there are sometimes a different definition of the e-scooter. <laughs> The usual, uh, indeed. So you can, you because uh, uh, we only ask for one type of e-scooters, not either kick scooter or the the moped. Okay. Um, so so I'll, we leave it up to you to to uh, consider which one it is. But uh, you're you're right. Uh, should probably ask for the two with the slightly. Trottinet is definitely uh, a version that makes it uh, most complicated, but indeed, um, uh, that will probably pop up throughout. Uh, um, uh, let's all of us make, uh, well, when we see the pictures, then of course it becomes clear, but yes, thanks. Cool. Well, then. It seems to have been uh, an issue with the poll longer <laughs> working, so I can't launch the results. <laughs> okay. But we'll see it maybe eventually or yes. uh, I'll try to retrieve them. In the break. Great. Okay, -do. so then let's um, start with the introductions and welcomes. Um, we start first with our partner city, uh, Hamburg. Uh, a welcome by uh, Karin van der Linde from Hamburger Hochbahn. And then we'll have uh, brief introductions to the two partner projects that organized that workshop here, Solutions Plus by my colleague Stefan Werland and Mobimix by Iris Rüsch and Stefan Schimmer from the city of Rotterdam. Okay, Karin, over to you. Yes, uh, thank you, Oliver. And good morning and a warm welcome from my side too. Um, yeah, like Oliver said, uh, my name is Karen and I'm working at Hamburger Hofbahn AG which is uh, the public transport operator here in Hamburg. And I'm here at the Department of Change and Innovation. And we are responsible for the, for the um, project within the Solution Plus framework. And um, yes, it would have been a great pleasure for us uh, to welcome you here all physical in Hamburg, but unfortunately it was not possible for us to host this event in Hamburg as a face-to-face -face event due to the existing COVID restrictions we still have. So that's 
really a pity, but um, maybe we can have it uh, later on. So, but now we have to come together here digitally and I'm happy to see that we have so many participants. Um, maybe there will be some more later on. And I'm really looking forward for the interesting presentation we have. And I also hope for some expiring discussion within the next two days. So, and later you will hear also about more about the city of Hamburg, the mobility strategy, that you have more background information also about the public transport organization here in Hamburg. And um, so for now, I think that's it for my side. And um, I think I would hand over to, to Stefan or back to you, Oliver, I'm not sure. <laughs> Oh, can go directly to Stefan. Thank you very much. Good. Thank you. Um, Claudia, since I had to swap my computer, would it be possible for you to share my presentation on solutions platform? Great. Thank you so much. Yes, thanks. Um, welcome from, from Solutions Plus project as well. So we have our coordinator, Oliver, in the role of moderator today. So now I take over and just give you a brief insight on what we're doing in Solutions Plus project. Um, next slide, please. Yeah. It's um, an eco flagship project, which is called Urban Mobility and Sustainable Electrific Electrification in Large Urban Areas in Developing and Emerging Countries, and in brackets also in the EU. It's an Horizon 2020 project, which runs from 2020 to end of 2023. So it's still one and a half year to go and a budget of roughly 20 million euros. Uh, we have a consortium of more than 40 partners, which come from science and research, from public administration, from public transport um, operators, um, city networks, but also from, from the industry and the economy side. So quite interesting broad. And as you see, you know, we have a um, lot of worldwide living labs or demo projects, which we are following, supporting in this project. Right, please. Yeah, that's roughly our, broadly our approach. We're not only looking at vehicles and the prototyping and design of Greek local um, vehicles together with, with people from, from really the demo areas, um, but also on, on the operational side, be it charging or be it uh, mobility as a service applications, and also the integration of these new mobility solutions into the existing public transport network and the urban transport system. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. Great. Yeah, that's an overview where we are active. I run you through all these demo cases in a while so we can also move on. And probably also skip that slide. That's again our approach. Just give you a brief insight of what we are doing there and show you some of pictures, which is much more interesting than, than normal slides. Um, in Asia, we are, we are active in, in Vietnam, in Hanoi. Next slide, please. Where we are exploring how to use shared e mopeds or uh, e bikes as a feeder for, for the BRT system there. Next slide, please. Yeah, in Pasig in the Philippines. And again, you can you can just click through and I, I <laughs> yeah. Um, our idea is to support the development so the design and prototyping of, of small vans and also quad cycles and also have the charging infrastructure. Next slide. Yeah, this is how this this um, quad cycle might look like. It's just a prototype a design study, which would be a multi-purpose uh, vehicle for both passenger and freight transport, as said, designed and, and um, produced locally, but using European components, such as live trains from our industry partners. Right, please. Should give you a brief outlook on how this uh, uh, minivan might look like. And again, both for freight and passenger transport, please. Yeah, another example from, from Asia is Kathmandu in Nepal. And again, <laughs> sorry for just, um, yeah, where we are um, just following or pursuing the, the um, conversion of a diesel bus into an e bus, looking into how this, whether this is feasible from economic and technical side. And next slide, please. And also look at these um, Safa tempos, which is the backbone of, of local public transport, and um, how to remodel them into, into e vehicles. We also have in most of the demonstration actions a cooperation with Technic University of Berlin with the Urban Design Studio, where we ask them, um, students to, to bring up ideas how, how central mobility hubs and city center might look like just to combine safety, accessibility, um, e-charging solutions, et cetera. Yeah. This was the example for, for Kathmandu. Going to Latin America, we're active in, in Uruguay, in Montevideo. 
and expect these. <laughs> a lot of clicking work here. <laughs> um, there are the ideas about how to, um, to, to use uh, opportunity charging in, in central e -bus, uh, bus stations, also how to open these solutions up for e-taxis and, and light electric vehicles. And also in next slide is how to improve the overall functioning of the terminal slide, please, which was again um, done in cooperation with the TU uh, Berlin Design, Urban Design Studio. And next one, please. Another component is um, the assembly and the local design of e-vehicles, freight vehicles in this case, which would be cargo bikes or quad cycles, free cycles for urban transport activities. Go on, right? Yeah, in Quito, in Ecuador, Latin America, pretty much the same. Also the, the building of all the, the prototyping and design and building of uh, light vehicles, building on or using European components and also charging infrastructure for e-buses. That's quite good. If you just click further and I, I follow you. So then we also meet the 10 minutes time. Um, coming to Africa, there is um, one example in Dar es Salaam, Tanzania, where we link the existing BRT system um, with E3 wheelers as either for um, for exactly these bus systems. Um, also with all these combining things like uh, whether to use um, batteries for being stations, uh, whether to, to retrofit or to use new E3 wheelers. Yeah, and also again with the design study on how this terminal might look like. And next one. Next example from Africa would be Kigali in Rwanda with an implementation of an e -bike, a shared e-bike system. And also next slide please, the electrification of e motor taxis, which is also backbone of public transport there, obviously. Yeah, which could be also be electrified and used with new combined with new um, business models. <laughs> Sorry, Mr. Okay. And now just coming to the last area, which is Europe, two brief examples, one from Madrid, where we are exploring the use of these inverted pentagraphs for e-bus charging in a new bus depot. The specific special thing here is about that the pentagraph is fixed to the pole um, and not on the vehicle, just to yeah make it less um, vulnerable for yeah and, and better usable. And next one, please. Yeah, and now this is finally Hamburg. Don't need to talk much about that since we hear a lot more um, from from our colleagues from Hamburg. So the idea is how to use these e-kick scooters um, as a feeder in, in areas outside the city center. Next slide, please. Yeah, um, and yeah, which is uh, located in Langenhorn, things with the yellow arrows pointing to. Um, as said, the idea is how whether these, these scooters could be used also in areas with, with less um, up transport quality standards or, or um, service standards. Um, next slide, please. The demo area kicked off roughly one year ago. Um, we'll hear much, much more about this from, from Karen. And again, we had the collaboration with the TU Berlin Urban Design Center here. So I leave you with that. If you want more insights in, in our demos, um, you could point it to our website. There's much more information, and of course, you can always approach us. So from this, over to Rotterdam. Thanks. Thank you, Stefan. So I'm, I will be presenting together with my colleague, Steve van Schimmel. Uh, we're both uh, advisors at the city of Rotterdam in the field of smart mobility mainly, uh, but also we do some shared mobility projects, uh, which is Mobimix uh, in this case. Um, so yeah, you can go to the next one. Uh, so Mobimix, what is it about? Um, so yeah, the, the start date was around March 2020 uh, and the end date uh, will be uh, either in September, end of September or potentially extended by six months. So we'll be, uh, I think, till, till the end of this year, but that's not, it's still a bit uncertain. Um, the total budget is uh, roughly 3 million uh, and the funding by the European Regional Development Fund is around 1.8 million. And we as the city uh, are the lead partner in the, in the project. Uh, so the overall objectives um, is to help cities decarbonize road transport uh, and mainly by facilitating the private sector to more effectively implement shared mobility solutions and mass solutions. Um, I will come back to some uh, examples of the cities uh, later together with my colleague. 
and the overall goal is to reduce CO2 re emissions and avoid or replace fossil fuel car trips uh, with more sustainable shared uh, options. So we are working together with five uh, cities, uh, which is Rotterdam, Antwerp, Norfolk, Mechelen and Valenciennes. Uh, also two knowledge partners, which are Ghent University and Gustav Eiffel University, uh, and also our partners Polis, Como UK, Transelli Tech Park and Cambridge Clean Tech. So now we're going through the five cities and the pilots and we will we'll be uh, swapping it together, Stefan and I. So Stefan, can you uh, take Yeah, it? sure. Uh, can you hear me properly, by the way? Fine. Uh, well, yeah, let's start with Antwerp. Uh, we want to give you a brief overview of the five Mobimix cities and their pilots, um, including the project timeline. So uh, let's start with Antwerp. Um, one note, by the way, uh, if we miss some crucial information, don't hesitate to mention this in, uh, in the chat, for example. Um, Antwerp, yeah, focused for work-related travel, uh, tailor-made for companies in search of sustainable corporate mobility models. Um, Antwerp did not choose for one specific mass operator. The city is collaborating with three uh, mass providers to engage companies which would normally provide their employees with uh, cars. Um, the aim is to provide employees access to a diverse mobility offer, which becomes more convenient than the company car. And the three providers are the Olympus uh, for Antwerp, the Skipper and the Car Reduce uh, Antwerp. And if we go to the next slide, we can see the, the timeline. Um, yeah, it started November 2022. Uh, COVID affected the, the pilot, of course. Um, and yeah, the last month in April, there was a second survey launch. So we hope to complete the whole pilot uh, somewhere this year. If we go to the next city. Then I will be <laughs> handing over Mechelen. So in the project of Mechelen, there were actually two projects, which the first one is the shared e-cargo bikes with Cargaroo. Uh, it's by offering affordable station-based shared bikes. Uh, and um, it's uh, actually an extension of a current uh, a collaboration from two to nine car e-cargo bikes. Uh, and the second project in Mechle is the Sharing Neighborhoods project. And in this project, actually, um, the aim was to offer uh, a neighborhood uh, with 26 people uh, access, free access, actually, to public and shared transport modes. Um, and the challenge actually was to leave their private cars aside for 60 days. Um, and also the timeline for this project, uh, if you go to the next slide, um, you see that both projects started uh, not at the same time. So one started in November 2020 and the other one uh, around May 2021. And both projects for that, there were set out tenders to select a market party. Um, and then the, the projects will, yeah, in September 2021, the first survey also launched. So it's maybe important to mention that within the Mobimix projects, we actually do different surveys. Uh, to, to get a results and to do the analysis as well. So we do one survey before the projects, which is the pre-survey. We do one in between, which is the ex ante survey. And we do a survey uh, afterwards, which is the ex post. And actually we do that for all the projects within the cities, all the pilots or projects. So now you can go to the next one, yes. Thanks for the survey uh, explanation, Aris. Uh, Norfolk. Uh, there are two initiatives in, in Norfolk. One is the e-scooter and the training. So we are looking to uh, yeah, support a green start. Um, there are some e this These are the e-scooters, um, the other e-scooters uh, in, in, in compared to Rotterdam. We use the mopeds, uh, but here are the, the steps um, in Norwich and the second in, in Great Yarmouth. Um, the second one is the community designed Mobi hubs. So together with the community, they yeah, design uh, a Mobi hub. And the impact assessment uh, estimates that the number of active users could be around 50,000 uh, and the carbon reduction would be around 70, 70 tons per year. So that's, uh, yeah, that's good, I think. And if we go to the timeline, um, started in September, 2020 with a, pilot launch and also um, there was a question mark 
uh, at the second survey launch, but we want to complete the impact analysis also uh, somewhere this year. If we go to the next city, it's Rotterdam. So then we go to our city indeed, Rotterdam. So in Rotterdam, we actually uh, have three uh, projects that we follow within MobiMix. So we have the, um, actually three different car sharing uh, projects. Uh, and also uh, next to car sharing in Rotterdam, we also have other shared mobility projects. But in this case, for MobiMix, we're, gonna, we're focusing on the car sharing. Um, also, we think that with car sharing, we can um, uh, achieve lots of uh, CO2 reduction. Uh, and that was the thing that we find, found interesting. Um, so we have the free floating model. And in this case, we aim as a city to uh, um, have 600 free floating uh, um, cars in the city uh, with a permit uh, um, regulation. Um, however, um, due to the ch chip shortage, but also uh, it started during COVID, uh, we now uh, have around 100, 150 electric uh, cars deployed, um, which is not the, the, the 600 that we aimed for, but still we are working, uh, working on it. Um, the second project is a station-based model um, that are 10 shared cars in a city garage. Uh, we also plan to uh, deploy more, actually 20, uh, but currently there are 10 uh, in one of our city garage. And it's also interesting to see the difference with the free-floating and station-based, since the free-floating is, for instance, more visible in the streets, uh, while the station base in this case is also situated in the, in the city garage, which is, which is not that visible. So we actually also uh, look into uh, those lessons learned. Uh, and the third project is a more neighborhood-based cooperative model. However, uh, we wanted to uh, implement this more yeah, neighborhood-based project, but it was not that successful uh, since uh, the few users were interested. And uh, now we are actually uh, also embedding it into MobiMix to find out uh, what are the reasons that it wasn't successful. Um, so yeah, also for the timeline. Um, so from March, 2021, uh, the new licensing system for car sharing um, uh, was there in Rotterdam. And then from April, the first 103 floating cars were deployed and also the, um, uh, the station-based cars uh, I think a bit around the same time. Um, yeah, and the, the completion for the impact analysis will also be around September, so also the end of this year. So and we move please. on to the last, Mobimix City, Valenciennes. Uh, thanks, by the way, for your comment, uh, Matthew. You mentioned that 50,000 people signed up um, the barrel e-scooter pilot, and the second server survey will be out soon. Um, the last Mobimix city, it's Valenciennes, it's in the northern part of uh, France with 40, 40k inhabitants. Um, the city implemented two mobility hubs. I don't know uh, if the service offices uh, on the right are, yeah, they are good readable, uh, but the services at the mobility hubs are uh, public transport offer, uh, bicycle services, uh, shared bikes, uh, shared e-scooters, car sharing, electric uh, charging stations, uh, travel information, and some other extra uh, services such as restaurants, cafe, uh, etc. And some of the services are offered by providers like Donkey Republic and Transfeed. Um, if we move on to the, the timeline of Valenciennes, um, yeah, it's quite the same as uh, the other cities. Um, summarizing the five Mobimix cities uh, with different pilots, uh, so Antwerp, where uh, the B2B mass pilot is currently um, active in Mechelen, the shared eco car cargo bikes and the sharing neighborhoods. Uh, Norfolk, the e-scooters e and the community designed Mobi hubs. Uh, Rotterdam, the free floating station based and cooperative uh, car sharing. Uh, and Valenciennes, the two mobility hubs with uh, multiple facilities. And then we move on to our last slides. Thank you, Stefan, for summarizing. That's very helpful. So actually during the MobiMix project, we also uh, made some insight reports around different topics. So for instance, the first insight report, you can go to the next one, yes, uh, is the, the mass scene, which is an insight report uh, on uh, mobility as a service. And the second insight report we published, published is the car sharing insight report. 
Um, and there are um, maybe two upcoming, but there is one upcoming, which is the Mobility Hubs Insight Report. And to be discussed is one report about how to use shared mobility data for policy making. Maybe Lorena, you can explain a bit more how people can find the reports uh, in the chat. Maybe that's uh, interesting to tell. Um, yeah. And yeah, we now, also uh, yeah. want yeah want to uh, make a decision making framework. Uh, it provides mobility planners and uh, policy makers with a brief guide on aspects to uh, consider in the implementation of shared mobility and mass. It also built on the results and lessons learned in in Mobimix. And there, uh, we will map future needs and potential development um, directions in the post-COVID urban environment. So that's the goal of the mobility, um, the decision-making framework for the mobility decisions framework. And if we go to the to our last slide. So yeah, the also another project achievement is the smart mobility guides. Uh, and the, with this guide, we were aiming to an improvement of collaborations between mobility operators and public authorities. Uh, so the pu public private partnerships. Uh, and this guide is actually an online uh, guide, which you also can uh, look into. Um, and it was developed by providing insights on strategy, procurement and partnerships. So it's actually quite nice to yeah, go a bit through the guide and see if there are any interesting things more on the broader scale uh, of smart mobility. So that's pretty much it from yeah. Mobimix. Thank you. Thank you so much. Greatly appreciate it. Great overview on the two uh, projects. And now we go to our virtual host city for today, city of Hamburg. And we're here about more uh, about the climate neutrality and mobility strategy. Uh, from Gesina Vizios from the Hamburg Authority for Transport and Mobility. Gesina, over to you. Yes, thanks for having us here from Hamburg. I would like to give a brief overview about the mobility strategy in Hamburg. First of all, I would like to share my screen. So I'm doing it now, and I hope that you will see the same as I do. Um, may you see now the presentation and not the notes? Yes. Okay, great. <laughs> so I can um, guide you through my presentation. My name is Gesine Mitzius. I'm processing new mobility here in Hamburg at the Authority for Traffic and Mobility Transition. And I would like to give you a brief um, outline of the mobility strategy of Hamburg, as I said before, giving chances and also challenges of new mobility, of course, where we have today our focus on new mobility. Um, my agenda is, of course, giving a framework of climate neutrality. Mobility strategy can only be seen in this framework. Um, then I would like to give you an overview of new mobility in Hamburg, the chances and challenges which we are dealing with. And uh, at the end, you have, of course, the opportunity to um, answer your questions. While talking about Hamburg, we are talking about a mobility transition in a prospering city. Estimated 2 million residents in 2030. At the moment, we have nearly 2,000 million inhabitants today. This means we are coping with continuing growth, more housing, more traffic, more noise, and of course, more air pollution, given the circumstances of climate change and our, our goal to achieve quality of life for now and for future. Therefore, we have to um, elaborate a good mobil mobility strategy to reach this goal of quality of life for our inhabitants. And I would like to show you how we are trying to reach this goal. We have to see our uh, strategy strategy, of course, in the circumstances of climate neutrality and mobility strategy. This can only be seen in the given framework from our federal government, uh, which outlined the goal to reduce emissions by 65% by 2030, reaching greenhouse gas neutrality by 2045. Of course, you know all the other circumstances, frameworks, therefore I would not like to outline this according to our 
a certain amount of time. While talking about our mobility strategy, we have this framework in mind that we have to reduce our emissions and we would like to reach this by two given goals. We would like to decline our motorized individual transport by nearly 20% of modal split in total of transportation in Hamburg. And we would like to increase our eco-mobility up to 80%. Eco-mobility meaning walking, biking and public transportation. This is our shift we would like to reach by 2030. These major goals, of course, we can not only reach by increasing the share of eco-mobility, we also have to um, outline other instruments to reach gas neutrality by 2045. These are guaranteeing public transportation as a backbone of our mobility in Hamburg, developing towards a bicycle-friendly city, and optimizing multimodal networking in Hamburg. How to fulfill this strategy by looking now in the fields of action, of course, including but not limited by, we have our goal in public transportation with a project called Hamburg Takt, in which we would like to access every inhabitant in our city within five minutes, a transportation opportunity by 2029. This is a very ambitious goal, we know. <laughs> Second, in our cycling goals, we would like to upgrade towards a bicycle-friendly city, as I said before. Therefore, we have to need fixing of 150 kilometers of Velo route. We have implemented um, already very, uh, or not very little, but uh, we have implemented street roads where only bicycle are the dominated transport um, um, transport um, mode. And um, we would like to implement our sharing system of Stadtrat to 4,500 bikes, sharing the system all over Hamburg. And we would like to offer facilities for approximately 28,000 bicycles at all 133 overground stations by 2025. In the field of electrification, we have the goal of having 30% of all cars electronic, uh, as electronical cars. And we have the Hamburg master plan, meaning publicly available load infrastructure um, all over the city. We, have, we are ordering electronical buses already since 2021. And <clears throat> we would like to have the whole bus infrastructure in public transportation electrificated by 2030. Now I would like to focus on new mobility and um, therefore we as a city of Hamburg think that new mobility is a great chance for us to achieve our mobility transition instead of having uh, the, um, the motorized individual cars all over the streets, meaning using instead of owning as a tool for us to achieve this transition. First, I would like to give you a brief overview of new mobility in Hamburg. We are having car sharing system, bike sharing, e-bikes, electric mopeds, and e-scooter, meaning the kick scooter. In the following, I would like to concentrate on the e-scooters. Um, but first, I would like to give you also an idea of what we are um, mainly achieving in our strategy. We are mainly promoting sharing systems, as I said before, using instead of owning. Therefore, we are implementing the so-called HVV HVV switch points as mobile stations, where you can change your mobile, your transport mode from, for example, sharing a car to sharing a bike or e-scooter, 
for coping with the last or first mile. Um, at the moment, we have 89 inner city locations of this of these mobile stations, and we would like to reach 220 locations by 2024. On the other hand, we are implementing autonomous vehicles with our white pooling Moya, which is VW and BMW as a corporation. Um, and we would like to um, reach autonomously driving by 2025. At the moment, we are already testing these cars uh, produced by VW in the district of Winterhude in Hamburg, but they are not autonomous driving now. Yeah, there are also challenges with new mobility of which I would like to give you an outline, but also there are ch chances which we have to keep in mind, um, meaning chance or having chances, chances in mind, I'm talking about that there's less infrastructure with which we have to implement before using, which is for us as a city, a great, a great change and uh, advantage, according to, for example, building in Uban. Now focusing on e-scooter, I would like to give you an overview. And here in this picture, you can see the amount of e-scooter currently operated by different providers in the city of Hamburg. Of course, there's a concentration in the inner city districts, but there are also some use in the outer skirts uh, where we have also our projects um, on which we are concentrating today. We have 17,500 operating vehicles at the moment. We have two to three landings a day, coping um, two kilometers on average as a distance. The drive is between nine and 11 minutes on average. And as I said before, it's mostly used in the city center districts. This is why in this inner city districts, we are especially coping with the challenges of new mobility, as I would like to give you a brief, um, yeah, build in mind by showing these pictures. The main problem is the dropping of the providers, which is, as you can see here, uh, near to the marks for blind people by coming out of the bus stations and nearly fell onto this e-scooters. This is a great challenge and not very, um, yeah, not very rare there is a real danger for pedestrians and especially for disabled persons. Of course, we have also the, the concentration of the return in front of the entrances of our public transportation systems, uh, as you can see below as well. Therefore, <clears throat> um, we have to cope with this as a city and it's not a problem of implementation. Uh, it's not a problem of awareness, but it's a problem of implementation in Germany as we have no legal foundation yet. And we as a city in Germany, you have to um, keep in mind, would I like to set goals or would I like to set restrictions? Keeping this in mind, Hamburg has, his, has found its own way to cope with the challenges of new mobility, according to e-scooter. And uh, this way is a volunteer, voluntarily agreement between the providers and the city of Hamburg, of which I would like to give you an overview in the following slide. Meeting the challenges, meaning our voluntary uh, agreement with our providers on which in which we have agreed to firstly a dashboard where we as a city have a controlling system by real data service of the MDS interface where we can see where the scooters are dropping if it's prohibited or if it's um, in the giving lines they are allowed to drop we have a round table where we are meeting with the providers every quarter of the year, meaning every three months. We have no parking zones 
which I would like to give you an overview in the following slide. We have parking areas, as you can see here in the picture, where the scooter users are allowed to drop their scooters or to uh, return their scooters. Um, we have the tool of a photo of return, which every user has to do by returning the e-scooter. He has to take a picture and to upload it in the app to make sure that the return is not disturbing any other um, pedestrian on the road. We have a compliant mailbox where everybody at Hamburg can do an announcement. We have walking patrols of the providers and we have a reconnaissance of users, especially in different, um, different um, ways. We have uh, internet-based announcements. We have um, on special events, we have uh, reconnaissance of users as well. There, we had an event where users or where particip participants were introduced to use the e-scooter um, to get a feeling of the use. And um, of course, we have also controls and our controls of the city are allowed to ticket um, prohibited returned e-scooter or e-scooter which are um, an acute danger for the pedestrians. And uh, here is a no parking area overview. These red signs you can see in the areas are all the prohibited areas where e-scooters are not allowed to drop off or to return by the user. Especially these um, very big fields are our green parks. In every park, it's not allowed to drop an e-scooter or to return it by the user. And of course, there's a concentration of prohibited areas in the inner city district, especially according to the vapor barn where our nightlife is taking place mainly. At the end, I would like to give you a brief overview of, a, um, of another project of the city in which we are dealing with new government tools for German cities according to new mobility. This is called the Kogomo phase the second in the southern part of Hamburg, um, where we are dealing with an outskirt suburb in which we have less new mobility infrastructure. And therefore we would like to um, focus here on a tool and a strategy of how to implement new mobility tools in outskirts suburbs. Besides our projects in the northern parts we are dealing with today. And now I would like to thank you for your attention. I have another slide where you can um, click to our programs, to our goals, to get information and a brief card of Hamburg to get a whole overview with our projects in the northern parts we are talking today. Thanks for having us. Thank you very much, Gesine. Much appreciated. Great overview of, of the strategic element and then some concrete examples. Um, do we have any specific direct questions to Gesine? There are only a few minutes late. So there's, quite, there's quite a few in the chat, however. Cool. Well, then let's. Why don't I see the chat? Ah, wait a minute. Sorry. I need to go in there. Sorry. I don't seem to. Ah, oh, yeah, now here it comes. All right. Cool. But I mean, as we are only uh, 30 people, do also feel free to jump in and uh, post a question directly. Uh, yes, I can. I can do it. I wrote a few of the questions. So, um, First, I have a, well, I'm, I'm, well, I didn't introduce myself because I arrived five minutes later. I'm Laura Babio working with Claudia on police and working in Moimix. 
and um, thank you very much for the presentation. It was super interesting. I just have some um, particular questions. For instance, the last uh, regarding to the e-scooters, just to know if there are any restrictions to the e-scooters to drive to ride through the parks, and if you have an official guideline or criteria to select these no parking areas, or do you just need it, do it out of need? The e-scooters are allowed to drive through the parks, but they are not allowed to um, be returned in the parks. Okay. Yeah, therefore we have a GPS-based restriction. So if the user tries to return his e-scooter there, it would not be possible. And um, could you yes, repeat for the, the second question again? Please? For, for the no parking area, I'm just asking if you have like an official criteria or guideline that you use to select these no parking areas. I mean, ah. some of them obviously like the parks are very obvious, but mm -hmm. then there are others that mm -hmm. seem like very uh, specific, like a square or something like that. So I'm just asking if mm -hmm. you do it just out of need when you observe yeah. that there is a need yeah. Yeah, or. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we are doing it, it out of need, basically. Um, as I said before, it's a bit like not giving goals, but doing restrictions afterwards. <laughs> so we are having this round table with our HVV and the HVV, which is um, managing the whole transport system in Hamburg. They are having a great focus on where are the problem, where are the, where are the zones of problematic dropping or returning e-scooters. And we are in a discussion and whenever there's a problem, we discuss another no parking area for Hamburg, especially in the Reeperbahn district. We are at the moment discussing a further a widening of the no parking area, for example. So it's more like um, reacting afterwards in the at the moment than um, setting goals um, before having the problem. And the problems are just that like usually that there is like uh, that the the e-scooters are parked like in uh, taking too much public space or like that uh, what you mentioned with the with the dis with the disabled people like this is the kind of thing that you discuss or yeah, yeah okay what i think Especially that's great for the disabled people in hamburg it's very problematic uh, so we are trying to have this quality of life for everyone which is our main goal that's very nice thank you Good that you have so such an active like uh, conversation and discussion. Yes, we are very pleased that the providers are having a, such a yeah um, a voluntary um, mm -hmm. exchange with us. One other question, Gezin, from uh, Rotterdam. Mm -hmm. We don't use this uh, e-scooters e in the Netherlands yet. Hopefully, mm -hmm. maybe this year or next year. Mm -hmm. uh, we know the advantages of the e-scooters, uh, but what are the biggest obstacles or barriers with the e-scooters in Hamburg? Uh, the parking mm -hmm. aspect or traffic safety? Mm -hmm. um, traffic safety is an issue, according to drunk people. <laughs> But I mean, the main issue is the dropping and the returning. There are, of course, dangerous situations where, for example, an e-scooter is lying in the middle of the pedestrians and there is a blind people coming up here. As you can see in the picture, this is actually a blind person and there's mm. an e-scooter just in front of her. So these are very dangerous situations we are coping with. And these are, of course, according to the um, missing law in Germany, um, as I would like to give here, yeah, the missing legal foundation in Germany is a very big problem because at the moment it's common use um, as the e-scooter and for taking the step for announce it as a special use, we could do it as a city, but it's not legally um, it can be legally, um, it cannot, um, oh, I'm trying to find the right word, sorry, I have it here. Um, it's not a legal basis we have at the moment. So it can be um, legally, it's legally incontestable in Germany at the moment. And that's, and that's the main problem. So now we are doing it on a voluntarily basis with the providers. 
Okay. I hope it's clear what I wanted to outline to you. Yeah, yeah, sure. Thanks. <laughs> Maybe just a tiny follow up on that from the chat, and then we could also see if there are others in the chat that you you can maybe uh, answer directly. But how many e scooter operators are there in Hamburg, and how did you decide on how many to have, or was it even a decision? Uh, there was not a, a, uh, a decision. It was more like um, uh, that the market is wooing, whether yeah. there is a new provider or not. And we as a city are then coping with the e-scooter, as I said before, on a voluntary basis. And we are very pleased that the discussion is so, um, yeah, it's so good with the providers. So at the moment we have um, five different providers we have bold bird tier lime and voy since june 2019 thank you very much and indeed i mean from a dutch perspective one could argue you know for a cycling nation the competition between the e-kick scooters and the bikes on the uh, on the same lanes is quite hefty so you do wonder if you, I mean, that so far is the logic for not letting them in basically, right? So it, it's it's not an easy topic, um, but no. you know, more to discuss. Uh, so let's move on to the next presentation um, uh, from Karen van der Linde. Thank you very much. And- uh, uh, You're welcome. Gesine, if you want, if there are still some open questions that you may want to address directly or drop in also your links maybe that you wanted to share, that would be quite uh, uh, appreciated. Thank you very much. I would like so to do moving that. over to Karen and uh, looking into the uh, introduction of the public transport uh, system in Hamburg and the approach and the alignment with the city ambitions. Yes, Karen, right. over to you. Can you see my screen in the full screen? We can see it may just be for me, but it's very small. I think that's because I'm I'm sitting here with a, a quite huge uh, monitor, so it's it's uh, for you a little bit small, maybe. But I hope that it's 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 working for you. Is it okay? It's okay. It looks okay. Okay. Then you can zoom. I, I can zoom. Yeah, I agree. Okay. Um, I will try to to speed up a little bit and to to make up some time. And I think I had also some something is already said by Gesine. So, but uh, yes, it's, it's me again, Karen, working for the public transport operator in Hamburg and just have a look what you can expect within the next 10 minutes. So um, let me start with a short overview um, about the mobility of Hamburg, then the, the Hochbahn strategy, which of course is based on the, um, on the overall mobility strategy, which Gesine just introduced to us. And finally, I will present to you some ongoing projects we have here in Hamburg for public transport. So here you can see how the public transport uh, in Hamburg is organized. So we have the so-called the HVV, which is more or less the overall brand and the, the face of the customer. So that's the public transport association. And within the HVV, we have several public transport operators which are then, of course, operating the public transport. And one of them is the Hofbahn, which is also the biggest public transport operator here in Hamburg. And we also have a few more. So here you can just have some figures. Like I said, we do have um, 28 operators in total, but most, uh, the, the biggest one is the Hofbahn and the S-Bahn Hamburg. And then we do have some smaller, especially bus operators. And you can see here some more figures about the HVV. So we do have, yes, in 2020, we do have um, 707 million passengers. Of course, we do have a strong reduction here um, due to, to COVID, but um, at least for the moment, we can see that we do have some, um, yes, um, some more passengers again. So we're really happy to see uh, that development. And maybe you just go to the next slide where you can see more facts about the Hofbahn. Like I said, Hofbahn is 100% uh, owned by the city of Hamburg. We do have more than 6,000 employees. And just for the Hofbahn, we do have uh, 300 million rides in 2020. Um, like I said, we do operate the buses, the metro system, and also the ferry lines. We do have, yes, more or less about 100 bus lines and also um, four metro lines and seven ferry lines. 
So let's move on um, to the next um, chapter here. So uh, like I said, there will be some repetition to what Gesine uh, just told us, but nevertheless, of course, this is the basis for our action. We have already seen that. So the, uh, that Hamburg has set itself uh, really ambitious climate goals, like the reduction of 50%. And of course, the transport sector and the public transport sector is affected um, since of is a major cause. And um, Hochbahn itself um, aims to be completely climate neutral by 2030 already. And here you can see some, some uh, measures how we would like to, to achieve the mobility transition to become climate neutral. So um, it is of course based on um, the reduction of private car usage to, to move to more um, eco-friendly um, modes of transportation. And then of course, we also need to cope with the increasing demand for mobility while at the same time reduce the CO2 reductions and also improve traffic flow and increase safety and reliability in the transport system that more people choose the public transport system voluntarily without a sense of loss in their private life. And uh, in order to achieve this goal, uh, the city more or less relies on the two important levers. So one is the alternative drive technology and the other is the shift to more environmentally friendly modes of transport. And like Elena already told us, our strategy here is the Hamburg Tact, which is more or less uh, the expansion of public transport services, uh, also including the new mobility offers. And the other, the other um, lever here is the electrification of our fleets. And uh, the next slide I can, I can, I think I will skip because we have already seen uh, our, our aim with the model split to, to shift to 30% uh, of public transport here. Um, and I think uh, really important is the so-called environmental alliance between the public transport and the bicycle and the pedestrian. So um, we have to rethink or more or less the, the understanding of transport, public transportation and also include the um, alternative modes of new mobility and like all the, the sharing um, offers so that we need to really find public transport as mobility with um, yes, shared resources. That's at least what, what we try to, to implement here. And um, yes, our strategy, like I told you, the Hamburg tax. So we have divided into five fields, um, which is more or less our strategy. So the first thing is uh, to gather in the environmental alliance. Uh, so like I told you, the cyclists and the pedestrians. And we try to have or increase more quality so that the customer experience is on a high level across all touch points and regardless in which station you are. And also we would like to increase the offer. So then the intervals, then the network and also create more space. And the um, fourth one is a uh, use instead of own. What I, what I told you about the integration with the um, new mobility operators and also with um, strengthening the background. So um, we need to stabilize the performance within, um, within our network. And this was the strategic perspective, more or less, and that brings us to our, yes, at least to some of our ongoing projects. So here, a bit for the future, like I told you, we will have a network expansion. So we will build a, a new um, metro line, the EU5. So that will be a construction of a new and fully automated uh, metro line. And with this new metro line around nearly 200,000 Hamburg, Hamburg will be uh, connected to the rapid transit network. And we will also have an expansion of the existing metro line, the U4. So um, yes, you can see that we try to create more capacity with the metro line, but of course these infrastructure projects are really, really long lasting. So we'll talk about um, the time horizon of up to 15 years. So it will take some time. And the other thing, uh, like I told you, is the electrification of our fleet. So since uh, 2020, we have decided to um, procure only zero emission buses. And right now we have around 150 e-buses and um, they have a range around up to 200 kilometers. So at the moment, we are more or less quite confident for that. And we try, of course, to, to increase it. And by 2030, then the entire bus fleet will be emission free. And the next uh, thing which might be the most uh, important in this context here is our mass approach. 
So we do um, we do have the mobility platform HVB Switch, which is our mass app more or less. So and the aim is here to is to bundle all availability mobility options and make them easily accessible with a one user account and, and just have one app to, to be able to use all these uh, mobility options we have in the in the city. And with the HUD switch app, we do have the digital integration, but besides that, we also offer the um, physical integration with our physical mobility hubs, the so-called switch car hubs, where uh, our customers can easily switch from our standard services with buses and subways to uh, other mobility options um, like bike and, and car sharing. I think you have already seen that in Katina's presentation. So just here, uh, just some screenshot of our uh, switch app and what, what is already integrated. So we have already integrated um, some of the new mobility in, in operators, but of course not all. So this also would take uh, some, some time. Um, yes, but you are able to, to buy your ticket and um, inform about your journey chain and it's also connected to, to Google Maps. And just here, just a um, short overview of our HVB Switch app. Um, like Azina also told you, that is more that's a, a mobility station and we do have the, the central ones, which are always connected to a metro station, but we also have the so-called decentral switch point, which are into the um, living areas so that you can park um, your car, for example, in front of, um, of your home. So we do have um, a total of more than 80 of these um, um, switch stations. And like I told you, around 80 um, just connected to the metro station and the other ones are in the neighborhoods um, for the last and first mile connectivity. So that was a little sprint, uh, but I hope I could give you some uh, useful information and uh, that you now have a little overview about how the public transport uh, is organized here in Hamburg. And then of course, I would like to answer your question if there are questions. Thank you, Karen, much appreciated. Great overview. Uh, I suppose there are a couple of questions were slightly behind, but not too terrible. So, um, just looking into the chat, maybe just one quick follow up on on um, you know uh, the different mobility providers and uh, your tool to integrate them, the Half of Our Switch app. So where do you see at the moment and hopefully in the future, like you know, a, a competition versus a complementarity of those offers? And in that sense, what are the uh, offers or the incentives for? providers to to join the app yes uh, that was what i what i tried to say that we need to redefine public transport and that we do not want to ask the question uh, to whom belongs the, uh, the curb because we think that we need to work together and that uh, public transport operators need to um, closely collaborate with the new mobility providers and in, in, in order to make the entire system more attractive and then uh, to be able to, to achieve this market share uh, together and see that uh, we would like to compete against a private private uh, car. So um, and that's, I think, the, we will be able to, to, to achieve this goal of the shift in the model split only when we, when we work together with the complementary mobility services. And I think uh, one other reason for the private mobility providers to participate within our project, the switch, is that um, I think we do have three major assets that we can um, bring is that we have, of course, the infrastructure because we own a lot of infrastructure in the city and therefore we can offer these exclusive parking spaces, for example, and these mobility hubs where they would like to participate. And the other thing is that we are a mutual partner as a public, as a public company. So we, we have, um, of course, we are acting in, in, as an instrument of the city and the third thing is that we have the frequency with the, I mean, we convey over 1.5 million passengers. So of course our passengers could be potential passengers for the private mobility providers. So I think there are some, some reason for them uh, to work with us. And at least uh, right now, they, 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 they like 
working with us. <laughs> okay, cool. Great. Maybe just a tiny a technical follow-up question, but maybe you can answer that in the chat, Aaron, if you want, but also see if there are others. Um, because, yeah, I suppose we need to move on. Thank you very much, Karen. Much appreciated. Um, so moving on to uh, the next segment, uh, regulating new mobility uh, and shared e-mobility solutions. Um, and we will start with um, uh, a, an input uh, from Rubin Dios, from, uh, who is the director uh, of the Agency for uh, Bicycling in uh, the city of Oslo. And I suppose you won't have a presentation, right? We're just uh, jumping directly into, into the Q&A, is that? I have a presentation. Okay, cool. Sorry, yeah. then uh, at, uh, <laughs> My apologies. So, Rune, uh, over to you, and uh, then we, um, uh, yeah, we're, we're looking forward to your presentation. I hope you can share your. I will try my best, Oliver. Uh, cool. Let me see. Uh, yes. Okay. Looks good. Yeah. Here we. Yeah. Go. You see a okay. nice picture of a cherry tree blooming. It, 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 beautiful one. Indeed. Yes. Yeah. I, I took it yesterday. Uh, greetings from Oslo. My name is uh, Rune Jös. I'm head of the mobility department in the Agency of Urban Environment in the city of Oslo. So I will talk, uh, have a, a short talk about micromobility and regulation in Oslo. Uh, okay, I did manage to shift. Uh, just to start, yeah, not at the beginning actually, but this is uh, pictures from the summer of 2021. Uh, we, uh, the last couple of years, we have experienced uh, a huge uh, invasion of, uh, of uh, e-scooters from various privately owned operators. Uh, in the beginning, uh, there were few operators and, and rather few e-scooters e and e-bikes uh, in our streets and it wasn't regarded as uh, a problem. Rather, it was regarded as a very uh, uh, exciting and fascinating new uh, mobility uh, form. But uh, as you see in these pictures, in summer 2021, there had there been such high numbers of uh, e-scooters provided by the operators in our streets. Uh, at one point uh, that summer, 2021, we assessed that around 30,000 e-scooters were around the city. Uh, they were actually centered in the city center and we got lots of complaints from people. And also it was uh, a, a very problematic for us as a local authority because we had no control over, uh, over these operations. But before I go into the regulation, what is Oslo? Uh, so a, a, a quick uh, geography and history lesson here. It, uh, Oslo is Norway's capital and main city. We were founded in 1048. We have a population of a bit over 700,000 in the city, but in the metropolitan area, we are around 1.1 million people. The city is uh, organized in 15 city districts. And very interesting is that two thirds of the city area or, or, or the area that the city uh, uh, is, is, uh, um, is built up on, uh, two thirds is protected land, nature and water. That means that one third of our area is the area we can use for development like new, new uh, housing, new business areas and infrastructure. That means that we have to be smart when we have to develop new mobility in initiatives be because we haven't got a lot of space. And uh, the interesting thing is that we have the last couple of years done a lot to promote green mobility. And as you see on the diagram to your left, in a few years from 2014 to 2018, there's been a huge shift in the numbers all the people using walking, cycling and public transport. In 2014, 63% of the daily travels were done by walking, cycling and public transport. In 2018, it had risen to 67%. A huge shift in, few, uh, in a short uh, period of time. And in the diagram in the middle, you see how the bicycle traffic is, uh, is increasing. It's increasing very sharp. We had a very high increase in spike in, uh, in 2020 due to the pandemic. But the trend is a very sharp increase in, uh, in, in, in biking. And also, as you see on the di diagram to your, to your right, 
we walk a lot. In Oslo, we t take our walking very seriously. Uh, actually, for many people, walking is the, an own mode of transport. I, I have a neighbor who actually walks to work five kilometers one way. Uh, so we are, uh, uh, Oslo citizens are a people accustomed to move around by their own feet or by bike or combining walking, cycling and public transport. That means that when the e-scooters, that shared micromobility was launched in Oslo, it met a very eager population seeing that this would fit perfectly into their daily travel patterns. So we, uh, during summer 2021, we had to introduce new regulations to regulate the share volume of e-scooters and, and shared micromobility. The 10th of September 2021, we introduced the first local uh, regulation. And the essence in those regulations was that you had to have a permission from the local authority, from the city of Oslo, to operate. There was set a, a, a cap of maximum 8,000 scooters. Remember, at that time, we reckoned there were uh, around 30,000 in the city centre. So this was a dramatic reduction. We, uh, we, um, we um, carved the city up in four zones, uh, making uh, and saying to each operator getting permission that you, only have, you are only allowed to have a certain percentage of your fleet in the various zones. The point with that was to try to um, distribute the e-scooters more evenly throughout the city because up to that point, most of the e-scooters was in the very central city district area, which was very, uh, which made it very, uh, very huge numbers of e-scooters in a very confined space. And also due to uh, some, uh, some volume of accidents, we also uh, uh, made it mandatory to have the operations closed during the night. Um, this was the first regulation. And 1st of April this year, we introduced a new regulation. Um, and the, it's based on the same, uh, same uh, regulations as the, the former regulation with one exception. Now we have put a cap on the number of operators. Uh, up to now, the 8,000 scooters could be shared by everyone meeting the minimum requirements that we set. Now we have set requirements uh, to operations, to traffic safety and to the environment. And based on those three categories, we have, uh, uh, we have um, uh, assessed and, uh, and, and uh, uh, assessed the operators wanting to operate and, and, and given, given permission for those three operators who, meet, who are meeting those three criteria at the best. So from the 1st of uh, April this year, the maximum cap is still 8,000 scooters, but now confined to three operators. Um, we believe that is a much better solution because we, we got some complaints from the public that it was uh, difficult to, to, to have so many operators who had a rather small fleet and it, Probably it's much better to have fewer operators who have a bigger fleet to, uh, to, to the disposal. Um, this new regulation is lasting just one year. And the reason to that, the reason to these short time frames for our regulations is that we aren't certain we have found the correct form of regulation. So we're, we're sort of, this is sort of trial and error. We are learning by our, call it mistakes, or learning by, uh, about how things work. And, and I, as a public servant, I find that quite interesting because I'm not actually used working like that. Um, and to conclude, uh, lessons learned of this, or more, more, more perhaps my refle uh, reflections is that uh, I've been working in the public sector since 1990. And I, I know my mindset is everything new, you are skeptical. Uh, it's almost in our DNA as a public servant to say no. Uh, thing is, it, it's always good what we have now. And I'm always a bit, uh, you know, looking at new things, thinking, ah, oh, that, that, can, that can't be good. But as the picture shows, it's taken in London for over 100 years ago. 
an e-scooter isn't a new invention, but what's new is that it's now not a novelty. It's well distributed and has in a very short period of time become a part of people's multimodality. So the bigger picture for me is how to fit micro mobility, shared e-scooters, actually shared mobility in the mobility mix we already have. And as I have shown, Oslo has made huge steps in greening transport. Under 30% of our uh, transport is made by car. And note this, that half of our car trips are done by electrical vehicles. So the carbon footprint from our transport is being drastically reduced. So the important thing is how to fit in this new, in, uh, this new uh, transport form, how to fit in shared mobility. And also what I feel will be very exciting is that God know what the future will bring. Some place, just as we speak now, somebody is inventing something new. And I think that a lesson for me as, uh, as, a, as, as a public servant working for a public authority is to approach new inventions, approach new uh, initiatives with opportunity looking at how could this actually go into the mix of green mobility and even make our transport even more sustainable. So that concludes my, uh, my presentation. I will stop sharing. Thank you so much, very much appreciated. And um, I did not know the picture. That's, uh, uh, there was, uh, news to me this is really great yeah. um uh, you, you gave us a, a positive uh, momentum on it was but with you know various pinches of salt let's say and this is very good um uh, just picking up a few questions and then we, we may have a, a short coffee break just mm -hmm. to get a short breather in between so um just a quick one i picked it so uh, there was a question on the eight thousand. was there you know how did you arrive there basically with regard to breaking down to that number uh, well um we uh we had a discussion uh in my department on what the right uh, number would be but uh, uh we uh, ended up the local regulation is actually sanctioned by the city council so in the end uh, the, the number was determined by my politicians so 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 we we gave a recommendation but they uh, in the end landed on the cap of 8000 so uh, and the, the first reactions from the operators was that 8000 was too low but when we narrowed the operators down to three, the 8,000 cap seems more, uh, it, it seems to be more sound. And also we see that uh, uh, the, you know, the use of each, each scooter goes much, much higher up. And also the logistics from the operators is much, much better, meaning, meaning that when you had 30,000 e-scooters lying around, you didn't have to have much logistics because there was al always an e-scooter in hand, but now, with a fewer number of e-scooters, the operators have to have a better logistic moving the e-bikes around. You said you limited the number of operators to three. Yeah. So they do get a license, and then yes. how did you how did you decide to get a, to write at those three then? Well, we we had three criteria that uh, they had to apply. Exactly. So they had to describe how they met the environment traffic safety and logistics. So, uh, and we had also a lot of criteria uh, in these three groups. So based on what, how they describe these three categories, we made an assessment and gave permission to those three when we uh, assessed met those criteria best. So it, it, so yeah. Great, thanks. And also Sam, that, that answers your question. All right, so then let's take a, Oh, even a 15 minute breathe there, uh, uh, Claudia, you're very generous uh, okay. to us. I mean, uh, I'm so engaged, I think if people should press and uh, <laughs> get a coffee and then continue to be so engaged. <laughs> Great. That's a very good no, idea. We do have some buffer time then in the discussion and as the discussion has been very uh, 
vivid and lively throughout, I think we can shorten it. So let's say, I would say in 15 minutes or 40. Cool. Okay, so let's reconvene at 40 then, uh, fresh, and uh, then we uh, jump uh, to Natalia's presentation. Thank you. See you soon. Okay, thank you. So, oh, sorry, I'm sorry. I'm not very used to, to Zoom. Um, uh, okay, I don't know where to place my <laughs> my toolbar. So thank you very much for um, this invitation. So um, I'm Natalia Cicciarello, I work for the city of Paris. Uh, I'm in charge of developing shared mobility, like car sharing and all, uh, well, urban shared mobility, like uh, moped, um, e-scooters or um, dockless bikes. Not Veli, which is the um, public service of, of Paris, and uh, so I was um, invited to to explain our parking, to focus on the parking offer of the e-scooters. Um, I don't know if you if you see the tools, and this um, might be not that uh, um, if this uh, bothers or not. I don't know. No, it's only only you can see that. So ah, okay. Okay. If you great. Just go to the next one. Uh, we'll, we'll be seeing just the full screen. There you go. Perfect. Okay. Great. So, um, just to give the context, um, so the city of Paris, as you can see on the on the on the map, is just a very tiny uh, central, um, well, territory in the um, takes part in of the region. So. Um, there are three, 13 million, almost 13 million inhabitants in the region, while um, a little bit more than 2 million inhabitants in, in Paris. And uh, we have a very dense area of more than 200, uh, 200,000 inhabitants per uh, square kilometer. Um, and the organizing authority of the transport and mobility is the region. So this is important to say because uh, we Paris don't have all the um, possibility to organize mobility. So the city has responsibility on traffic and parking regulation and on um, roadway and public space maintenance. So it's in this way that uh, policies are um, established and made. Uh, as well as I, well, so in, in Oslo was mentioned, um, uh, Parisians' households own only for 33% of households, they own a car, and only 11% of economical active Parisians commute by car. So it's a very high and, and dense um, public service offer. And uh, besides that, we have the, um, doc the docked uh, shared bike public service lead, which is like uh, 20,000 bikes uh, for the whole area which is covered the leave and we consider about 14 or 16,000 bikes for only Paris and then we have all what would be shared micro mobility private supply. Uh, we have about 30,000, 35,000 uh, vehicles today if we consider moped, e-scooter and bikes. Uh, just to give, um, well, a flashback for um, the, the, I would say for the, um, the framework, legal framework. Um, so the first dockless bikes appeared by 2016 with uh, City Scooter, which is a moped company. And then uh, we had to wait until two th the end of 2019 to get um, a national law that would include this dockless uh, offers and that would state and would specify that indeed this kind of offers um, they occupy the public space in a specific way. So um, well, it recognizes as a um, free floating offers as a occupancy of the public space. So uh, from that time, cities can deliver some permits and uh, in store some requirements and some prescriptions. Um, so 
still uh, from that time, um, these prescriptions, well, we would like to have prescriptions far more, um, uh, well, um, we, would, we would like to make more prescriptions, but we are quite limited as well. Um, so, for example, if we need to limit some operators or, the, or some fleets, then we have definitely to, to go uh, for a tender. Uh, we are not able to just to, do, to cap the number of fleet just by delivering, um, um, well, permits. Um, so if we look for e-scooters precisely, so a tender has been launched by the end of 2019, just when the national law was published. And um, so the idea was to select three operators and um, from that time, as the real problem was really where these uh, e-scooters would park, the city started um, preparing an offer of parking in order to be able to launch this tender and to contract with operators um, on the parking conditions. So um, 2,500 parking spots were created in, well, I would say, in less than one year. It was um, a very, well, innovative way of, of working. And um, as you see on the map, well, this is uh, Paris. So you can see maybe here in the central areas, there are maybe less, um, less red spots. So it means that there is less parking. Um, each parking uh, would would be um, available to, well, to, to park at least six e-scooter. And so we have capacity for 5,000, um, 5, 15,000 e-scooters. Uh, besides with this law, um, this law made that um, the city, cities in France, they have to, um, they have to take care of, Mm, of uh, pedestrian crossing and there is a law that we have to work on visibility five meters before pedestrian crossing so it was an oppor opportunity as well to to reduce uh, car parking places and create this um, this parking for e-scooter uh, so the um, so the each spot was location was determined first by using data that was collected from operators because operators were already working in Paris um, before the tender. And uh, by the time we had like um, 11 or, or 12. And um, so they were supposed, they had to share data with us in order to be able the city to control the number of fleet. So we could see um, where these scooters were located and um, and so there was a startup called Wintex who did a, a great job in, well, it was like a data scientist project by that time. Uh, so a selection of eligible, eligible locations was found um, by using successive filters. And um, so the idea was to reduce parking places and to, um, well, as I said before, to, to, to be able to uh, change the parking five meters before the pedestrian crossing and at least, well, this is what the operators told us that uh, in order to be able to have a good uh, parking net, um, we should consider at least, uh, well, 50, 100 meters from each spot to another. Uh, in fact, we would have, we would have parkings every 150 meters because 100 meters is too close um, besides today, what we see is finally the um, the leap, which is the um, docked public service offer, has stationed every thirty uh, three hundred meters. So finally, uh, the e scooter offer is um, well, it's more available. It's easier to 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 reach from any spot than the leap. So maybe it's something that we have to to check for the next steps. Um, and then, well, in Paris, we had uh, 20 boroughs, arrondissements. Uh, today, well, there's a central area, so uh, we, would, we would have like 16 uh, arrondissements. And um, so some large objectives were determined for each arrondissement. 
uh, and then precisely, well, we had to find the locations uh, by by the by the data mainly. Then, um, so at the same time, by December, uh, so the competitive tender was launched. Uh, as I said before, so only three companies were 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 able to allow to operate uh, since. So it's like in Oslo, I see. And um, we have dot line and tier since uh, September 2020. So there are 15,000 e-scooter and so uh, each operator can deploy up to 5,000 e-scooter. We did a two years permit, but today uh, we have uh, reconducted it for six months because well, two years is very, goes very fast and um, well, we have to work on launching the, the next tender, if any. It's a big question today. And um, according to the fee that operators pay, they have to pay from 50 to 65 euros per e-scooter, according to the fleet size. And so today operators can only park on the specific spots. Um, so today we see, um, in fact, if we look at the spots, um, there are two kind. We have just single ones that can only host um, e-scooter and we have some double one for e-scooter and um, dockless bike. Well, we don't have any, any bike here. They're all here in this picture. Uh, so, well, here you see the difference if everything is fine and when some uh, spots are overcrowded, I would say. Um, so it is true that uh, when when these parking spots were made, the idea was to have many of them and everywhere. And today we s it was like a territorial approach in order to have an um, equal offer everywhere. And today the idea is to work maybe in more um, adapting to uses. So we should work on maybe um, making some bigger zones where there are more uses and uh, maybe suppressing or um, maybe uh, well just uh, making leaving them like that on, on some areas where e-scooters are not that used and um, another thing is that uh, well uh, indeed we haven't um, we haven't um, imagined the the empty, um, I don't know how to say it in English, because in French we say taux de vide, which is the emptiness um, for parking, in order to be able to guarantee uh, parking in a comfort way for cars, we consider taux de vide, we know it's 20%. 20, 20 so in this uh, offer, we haven't considered the um, emptiness. So this is something that we might uh, be taking in consideration for the next tender, so if any tender is, is being carried. And I just wanted to share with you, for example, according to the data that we are able today to collect, we can control parking compliance control. Um, so here you see, um, for example, 34% uh, of the, um, the e-scooters are um, farther than 15 meter meters from the spot. Well, Still, this information is not that precise because according to each operator, according to each tool and according to the position, this is not 100% accurate, but we are working on making it as accurate as possible. So, um, well, we can say that almost of the, of the e-scores are well parked. And here in this graph, we can see the difference between operators. So we see that some operators are definitely mm, giving better results than others um, for parking. So it's something as well that we are working on how to, um, well, improve our, our control methods. Um, here you can see well, the, the heat map with um, on location, because every three hours the location of our e-scooter is, is being collected. 
Uh, so when you see red spots is that we have more, more devices. And um, here you have the daily evolution of the fleet size. Here is for e-scooter, bike, and mob. So, well, this is, was during the um, January. So there are less, um, there are le the fleet is a little bit lower than during summer. Um, and well, here, so this is some information that we have. Um, so what data is being collected? So today we have uh, mandatory data that has is being collected. We have uh, three API. And we are um, today we are working on MDS, which is something that uh, is really new, and we don't have yet uh, a lot of uh, competence on, on on this. So this is something new that we will be developing in 2022. Um, and uh, well, we will be um, we have been carrying um, a survey. Uh, after the, um, the COVID crisis period, because the last survey for users and users um, last from May 2019. So it was important for us to understand better users of, of e-scooter, but as well for Douglas Mobility. And so we'll be having the results in the next weeks in order to be able to, um, to better um, to better, well, to better organize the future tenders. And that's it. I, I, I well, if you have any questions or at least I leave um, um, the... Thank you very much, Natalia, much appreciated. Uh, so uh, there are a couple of questions here already in the chat. Um, some of them are answered uh, already. Um, okay, so I don't know. Uh, uh, Gizini, would you maybe like to ask a question directly? Yes, sure. Thank you very much, Oliver. Um, I would like to know you, uh, first of all, thank you very much, Natalia. That was really interesting for us as having not uh, such a um, tender here in Hamburg. <laughs> the Paris example is always for us a very inspiring um, issue. Um, I would like to know, you lined, outlined that the modal share of the motorized individual transportation in Paris is not as high as in Hamburg, that we keep in mind, but what were the reactions of having less parking spots in the inner city districts, and how did you cope with this? This would be a very interesting issue for Hamburg. Well, uh, I think it's an issue everywhere uh, when you take away uh, parking for cars. However, this was bef um, our lady mayor was elected, um, and in her program, she uh, promised to suppress half of the parking places in Paris. So, 60 today we have around 120,000 parking places for cars. And so, uh, in the next year, so until 2026, so she, we should be reducing by two this offer. So it's something that, well, Paris have been working. It's true that according to some neighbors or arrondissement, it's not the same um, acceptance, but uh, well, I see that today. And um, I think that, I mean, it's always difficult and we see that um, to convince everyone, but I think it's like something that we can now go back. When the time comes and we, you definitely need to reduce some car parking. So. Well, it's always difficult, I would say. Thank you very much. Thanks. Maybe I'll just pick up one from Sen here on the fees of the e-scooters. Do they cover the whole cost of administrating the scheme? And how is this shared between the boroughs and the region? Um, so the fees, in fact, in we don't have um, we don't handle the budget in that way, because everything what our um, incomes it goes to a global um, to a global like um, envelope. I don't know how to say it in English. Um, but so we are not really working in like in a 
in a business way to say, well, what is income and what is uh, cost? So um, we had to do that parking spots and well, it was not really defined. The, the fees were not defined like that. I mean. Cool. Thanks. Uh, Giacomo, you, you have a question on the logistics side. Feel free to jump in. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Jimmy, hi, how are you? Um, so yeah, my my question is connected to the yeah, data collection uh, part because I see you collect uh, very interesting and useful data, but uh, do you also connect, uh, collect uh, data related to the uh, other movements connected to, for example, the redistribution, repositioning of the of the scooters, how they do that, like if they use vans or, or uh, cargo bikes, or what are the, anyway, the, in general, the flows connected to the redistribution and battery swapping, because it's uh, also uh, secondary movements linked to, to uh, this. Thanks. No, that is a good point. And indeed, um, I mean, when we select operators, they had to, I mean, the logistic and the way how they operate their, their logistics, it was a criterion which they were uh, noted. However, today it is true that um, we have a lot to work to do in order to be able to control that what was promised is indeed done. So, um, I mean, we can we see that like uh, users mostly or by the different services of the, of the city but there's nothing like really formally established to to check that we don't have data either to be able to collect this information for the moment but it's a good point so maybe we have to think how we can introduce that Cool. And one last, maybe, Sergio, you had a couple of questions. I think your uh, off the record uh, question is not answered yet. So maybe uh, feel free to ask it and then Natalia can react. Oh, I can the ask. The event is being recorded, so I don't know how off the record it is. Oh, I see. <laughs> <laughs> this is the <laughs> I'm not sure that I, I don't see Sergio coming off mute, so maybe I can ask. Well, I mean, well, you can put it in the chat. I'm not, I guess the chat is not being recorded, <laughs> but uh, yeah, I mean, um, let's we could do an on the record version of uh, how this is being enforced, because uh, yeah. Enforced? I'm sorry, which is the question? Is it on the chat? Um, so Sergio is asking um, uh, how Sergio, we... Okay, Sergio, uh, so oops. So who takes care of the enforcement for the... Oh, the okay. off the record feeling, okay, yeah. It's, I can, uh, if the, oh uh, no, the thing is that, um, uh, well, there are always some things that we can improve on, and uh, the the main issue I would say that uh, e scores they don't have the um, license plate. So, um, like, well, in Germany uh, they are immatriculated, but not in France. So, this is an an issue. Um, we see that it's not the same problem like with the uh, moat um, for dockless. Uh, fleet. So it's definitely something that could be improved because today we only uh, we only um, wait on the good behavior of the user um, to be able to really um, make sure that uh, parking and uh, well this kind of of issues are are taking take place. Okay. Thank you so much. Great overview. So we are moving uh, now to Madrid. Uh, Carlos Mateo will uh, present from EMT Madrid on the BC Mat and the Madrid Micromobility Regulation. Hello. Hi, Carlos. Good to see you. Over to you. Hello. I can share my screen. Ba -ba -ba -ba. Okay, can you see it? 
Yes, perfect. Okay, well, thank you very much uh, for inviting me. It's a, it's a pleasure to be here. Well, uh, first of all, I, I would like to introduce ourselves briefly. Uh, we are EMT, we are a public transportation company uh, based in Madrid. As you know, it's the, the Spain capital. We are almost uh, 10,000 workers and we run many services in the, in the city. Uh, most of them related with, uh, with mobility. We run the urban bus uh, service. We also run Bicimat, that is the bike sharing system we have in Madrid. We manage a uh, parking lot network, towing service, uh, mobility as a service platform, and even we run the, the city cable car. We also have another business lines regarding consultancy and advertising. Well, here you, you can see the picture about the, the share mobility we have in, in, in Madrid. We have uh, more than uh, 20,000 vehicles, uh, including bikes, scooters, uh, mopeds, and, and cars. And here you can even check our position among other European countries in, in this matter. Our car sharing, our sharing, uh, first sharing experience uh, came from uh, 2010 with Ubiquo. Ubiquo was, was an is a station-based uh, car sharing system. After Ubiquo, uh, some other companies uh, started to operate, in this case, in free-floating modes, and they are still operating uh, today. So we have in Madrid more than 3,000 e-cars, and there are more than uh, 1.2 million uh, registered uh, users. Regarding mopeds, uh, the first company that deployed their uh, vehicles in the city was um, uh, a Cultra. And after Cultra, uh, many, some other companies uh, show up in the, in the city, but not every of them uh, are alive uh, today, at least in, in, in Madrid. But uh, despite this situation, we can see how the amount of uh, motor sharing units are still growing in the city. And we have more than 6,000 units uh, distributed throughout the, the, the municipality. Well, Bicimat, uh, Bicimat was a, a, an inflection point in, in Madrid uh, regarding the, the, the bike sharing system. We are really proud of operating this system because uh, we deeply think is the cause that the uh, bicycle is a common vehicle in our street today. Bicimat started in uh, 2014 with uh, 1,500 uh, uh, bikes, every single unit was electric. And for that time, it was a really huge improvement. And nowadays, our fleet are composed uh, with almost 3,000 uh, e-bikes distributed in 258 stations throughout the city. Actually, we are covering the 33% of the, the, the total road surface of the city that is in our near-term plans uh, to expand Bicimat to every single district in, in Madrid. And for Make It Real, we has just released a tender of almost 50 million euros to, to, to change the, the whole technology associated to the, to the system and make real that is um, make that that expansion real well after bithimat some uh, private companies uh, try to operate in in madrid but hey they they had to stop the following months because they couldn't compete with the municipal system the next uh, experience we have uh, with uh, free floating bike sharing system was in 2020 when the city council released our first free floating authorization process. Uh, in, this, in this process, six companies were authorized to operate in Madrid, but the fact was that only two of them uh, could start operating in fact. 
and only Bithimat Go, that is also operated by EMT, only Bithimat Go uh, could finish the, the, the period of authorization because the demand in this kind of uh, system here in Madrid is, is not enough to, to maintain many, many, many companies. This authorization process has been renewed in 2022. Well, I, I, I have to say that in every authorization process that uh, we have had here in Madrid, uh, the bike, uh, the, uh, those that refer in the bike sharing system and those that I will tell you that refers to e-scooters, there, uh, there has no company limitation. Okay, so we are working nowadays in a new tender where, uh, where we are really considering to, to limit the, the number of companies uh, after a dialogue with uh, the companies itself. In, as, as I was saying, in 2022, uh, the authorization process has been renewed and six new companies has been authorized to operate in Madrid. The big difference that we have between this process and the previous one is that five of those uh, six companies are in fact running uh, today. Regarding e-scooters, uh, the, the, the first deployment of uh, this uh, scooter company was in 2018 when there was no regulation in the city. The first regulation we had came uh, from October 2018. Uh, it was the first sustainable mobility by law. Uh, in that uh, by law, uh, they set uh, some parking and riding policies that the scooters and other uh, PMB had to comply. And these by law have been updated and extended in, in 2021. That is our actual regulation. Because there was no regulation regarding scooters and they we we have to 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 stand some issues regarding parking and the using of the public space without any authorization the city council made them to remove every single vehicle from the from the streets until they release in february uh, 2019 the first e-scooter authorization process in this process, up to 25 companies, as I said, there was no limitation, 25 companies uh, were authorized to operate more than 8,600 uh, scooters in the, in the city. But nowadays, only 10 of those 25 companies are still running. We have more than 5,000 scooters in, in Madrid. And it's funny to see how at the very beginning they ask authorization for running more than 100,000 scooters in the city. Well, as I said, uh, the law that, uh, that uh, manages the, the e-scooters and, and bike driving and parking today is the new sustainable mobility by law that it was released in September. It sets many, many many uh, many points regarding uh, regarding with uh, riding these vehicles and, and parking and not gonna read for sure the 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 point that they regulate point by point but you can check them here in the in the presentation if you need and uh, i have to say that the, these by law have been completed with physical measures like the, the definition of specific parking places for those uh, free floating vehicles, uh, both e scooters and bikes. And there is a real enforcement to the, uh, for the complement of the, of the, of the by law uh, with a specific actions. Of, uh, of the police that uh, that they real issue um, a lot of fines to this kind of vehicles and we really know that because when the police retired the vehicles from the street 
they they let them they leave them in in our depot because uh, as I said we we also run the the, the towing service in the city and the the, the number of fine are not uh, are not uh, are not a little okay well that's it thank you very much uh, here you have my my contact if you need so if you you have any question i it will be a pleasure to to answer that thank you so much carlos greatly appreciate it and a few questions are popping up here already do feel also free to jump in directly uh, uh following up from the presentation much appreciated maybe i'll start with a little icebreaker on uh, on that so uh, so where do you see the difference between so in in the uh regulation among uh the shared bike providers to also what we've now seen to the to the e-scooter regulations well, I, I didn't get the the, the question it it, it it was good how, how do you get uh, how do you understand the, the scooter regulation or what? So, so the regulatory uh, uh approach let's say to uh, towards the shared bike providers or the, to the uh, to to what we've also now discussed uh, over the past few presentations on the uh, e-scooter regulation. Well, in this uh, here in Madrid, well, first of all, in regarding authorization process, I uh, well, I have to, to say that I think it's a need to limit the the number of companies. It's 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 necessary because there is no uh, enough cake to be served uh, for for every company and when the when the demand is not is not enough and the 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 profit of the the company uh, th that doesn't exist what usually happen it's the service they provide usually has a, a, a poor quality okay so even uh, even when when we talk with the, the the companies, they want to 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 limit the the, the number of companies. So uh, they want it because what I'm telling you, what if there is like 25? We we had at the very beginning we had 25 scooters company. It's impossible that a company uh, is economically sustainable with the, the demand of this kind of service uh, to be served uh, between 25 companies. So, so even them uh, are asking for that. And so I think it's a, a very important, uh, a very important point. Another very important point is the data sharing. The data sharing, not only for control them, it's very important to, to, to control and to enforce the, the the regulation uh, but the 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 knowing uh, of this uh, from the city council of the people movement it's very useful to to the planification of course uh, to 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 plan where you have to to put more or less parking spaces or maybe where you can build uh, the next uh, the next bike lane uh, it's really important those uh, those data to be shared by by those companies and and of course everything related uh, with safety and uh, quality of service the service have to be a quality uh, uh, have to to be a, a quality service because if not what you have is a, a huge amount of vehicles through throughout the city and, and it's it's not a solution regarding parking well it's quite important to to expand the infrastructure at the end i think the client um, usually are glad to to know they are gonna find these uh, these vehicles in some spot in the city and and it is uh, it is uh, better than, or, or it's uh, it's make a minor issue the the problem of uh, not be allowed 
uh, to leave the the vehicle or whatever you want so so i think the, this is another another important point and of course uh, we have to 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 take out the vehicle from the sidewalk and it's really important enforcement by the police to 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 make it real cool thanks a couple of uh, practical questions here as well. Do you also regulate the uh, the, the charging? So, like in battery swap or uh, well, nowadays uh, every every service is based in in battery swap. So uh, we have uh, no regulation. We are piloting some. Some solution when uh, where the the um, the company make the battery swap in some infrastructures, but um, the the reality in Madrid is that every every operator uh, usually practice the battery swap in the street. Okay. So we we don't have any any regulation. Great. Thank you. Uh, Lorena, you also had a question. Uh, maybe you also want to jump in directly. Yes, thank you, Oliver. Um, so on the slide where you were describing the circulation restrictions, they seem to be very extensive. So I'm wondering um, how do users know, first of all, where to circulate, if it's relatively obvious, and also if this is as enforced as the parking, because you mentioned that uh, there were many fines given for uh, parking, but I'm also wondering if users in general would be fined if they circulated on a restricted road. Well, I... I... I can't even speak in first person because uh, we we receive uh, uh, I, I I will say some fines for for not saying many fines. Uh, we when we receive the fine, we have to to investigate uh, who left the bike there. So we usually uh, send the fine to the to the user. So, uh, so the, the the enforcement process is is real. The end is the user that have to pay for that fine. And another um, another quite big issue for the companies is when the the vehicle is retired and and transport to a depot. So this logistic is a problem for them. So so yes, uh, we 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 really enforce. And the, the other question uh, about the how the, the user uh, knows about the, the the regulation, well, we we did some um, some uh, actions, uh, some of them coordinated by the city council, as um, make a campaign um, hanging the information from the the scooters itself. Or uh, and every every company have to inform in uh, when they they sing up uh, where they have to 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 park or not and even the the parking is is uh, geolocalized restricted you know so they have to park in the in the spot if not they cannot uh, finish the tree and. Some, depending on the companies, there are some technologies that are really developed to 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 make sure with uh, precision they park in the in the correct spot. But did I understand correctly that there are some streets where users would not be allowed to circulate? There yeah. are some roads. Yeah. Well, in general. Uh, um, they cannot uh, circulate in pedestrian ways, okay? And it's there. There are some technologies now implemented in in scooters that detect that they are they are running the sidewalk or a pedestrian way, and the 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 e scooter stops. But it's not a must nowadays. So the the well, uh, it's a it's a work for the police, and and you know you you can you can. Uh, uh, you can correct some action, but uh, you cannot cover the, the whole city every moment. Cool. Thank you so much. And I guess 
we can pick up on some of those questions also after the next presentation. Let's see how we how well we then do for time. Thank you so much. Tom is much appreciated. Great overview and uh, great insights. And we're moving over to our lovely partners, partner city of Bremen and uh, Rebecca Kao Bauma will share some insights on the car sharing um, in the Share North project. Yes, I will. Thanks very much. Um, first question, is everybody still awake? If we're not, doing good. We're yeah, energized. Just move around. Yeah. Yes, I am with, with the help been... of two coffees. So it's it's fine. They've been really super interesting presentations so far. Good, good insights. But we've also been sitting down for a long time uh, and sitting is the new smoking. So um, yeah, nice to see you again, some uh, familiar faces. If you are sitting down and your camera is off, there's no reason why you can't stand up and move around a little bit while you're listening to my presentation. Um, right, screen share, here we go. I've been invited to talk today about car sharing, shared mobility policies, a little bit about e-mobility and the Share North project. And I'll try and do that in a brief, um, brief overview and look forward to your questions already. My name is Rebecca Karbaumer. I work as a sustainable mobility project coordinator for the city of Bremen. Um, my specialties have really in the last year Uh, especially in housing developments. And now my slides are not advancing. There we go. Oh, no. Oh, well, I was oh, going well. to ask because I wasn't able yeah. to see the slides, but now it's okay. There we go. Now you can see them, hopefully. Um, I'm also the coordinator of the Share North project, which is an Interreg North Sea region project. And when we started six years ago, we were the only project about shared mobility. And now there are many, obviously. So um, the relevance has really, really grown um, shared mobility in the last few years. And um, we're 10 partners and Coma UK, who's also part of the Mobi MobiMix uh, project is also involved in the Share North project. We are obviously just like everybody here today, I think strong pro proponents that shared mobility is a building block of sustainable mobility and integrated transport planning. Uh, like I said, six years ago, we were the only um, ones kind of promoting that message um, and the environment has really changed um, significantly. Um, in this mobility um, pyramid, shared mobility also plays an important role in encouraging active travel modes, reducing car use and reducing car ownership. Um, we've also created a really incredible guide to shared mobility um, in the project. It's the planner's guide to the shared mobility galaxy, which is highly complex. There are so many different modes. There are subcategories. Um, their impacts are different. The use is different. The terminology is different. And we really, in this 250 page document, tried to create a good overview. So especially planners who might have heard about shared mobility, um, but aren't experts, um, have a, a, a guidebook for navigating through this complex world. And also like um, in the discussion earlier today, um, figuring out in which nation, what, what is an e-steps? Is it, what's an e-scooter, a, tro a trotti, a trottoir? Um, you know, it's all the same things. And also differentiation, obviously car clubs and car sharing uh, as well. So um, that's available in English and German already, and will be available in Dutch and Swedish in just a few weeks. So. Um, check that out on our project website, and I'll also share the link in the chat um, afterward. There are also really good, um, very comprehensive case studies and good examples um, from policies and communication work, um, but also to, to individual implementation. But now I'm going to take you on a journey to Bremen, which is where I live and work. It's a city just off of the North Sea region, um, sorry, off of the North Sea, 60 kilometers inland with 570,000 inhabitants. So the little si uh, sister of Hamburg um, and I guess the, the, the niece uh, stepsister of, of Paris. Um, we have uh, a fairly low modal share of, of um, car trips um, for daily trips, but obviously there's still uh, room for improvement in this compact uh, walkable and bikeable city. And since the topic today is now about car sharing, 
why is car sharing even important? We say car sharing is the way or one method in which we here in the city of Bremen, uh, Bremen address the matters of spatial and resource efficiency. Um, that is first and foremost um, why we as a city promote car sharing and support car sharing with our policies because of this um, unfair distribution of, of public space and the space that private cars um, consume in, in our cities. Um, obviously, just like the rest of you, it's also reducing emissions, but um, in addition, you know, social inclusion and accessibility for people of all ages and physical abilities and improving quality of life in the city. And one example um, we see is the impact of station-based car sharing in particular. In Bremen, one station-based car replaces 16 privately owned cars. So obviously it's a way for us to deal with this, this urban, urban clutter um, that are privately owned cars. Car sharing also promotes sustainable travel behavior. I mean, when you use car sharing, car use becomes a rational decision rather than one of convenience or an emotional decision. And we know that car share users use public transport, walk and cycle significantly more than the average car owner. So there's a big behavioral shift um, there as well. And for that reason, car sharing has been part of our transport policy for, well, for almost 20 years now um, in the city of Bremen with our first mobile point, a mobility hub in public, um, public street space in 2003 to our car sharing action plan from 2009, um, car sharing law that was passed in 2019, as well as part of our parking codes for new real estate developments. Um, really interesting or an exciting process of which we're um, also working on currently. Um, we're revising our parking law for real estate developments and we're making mobility management measures like car sharing mandatory for every future real estate development. And one of the ways, obviously, we, we promote this or the strategy is the integration of mobility hubs. So car share stations in the public street space um, and highly visible, clearly accessible places and clearly marked places. Um, in the presentation from, from Rotterdam is clear station based car sharing has to be visible in order to be yeah, perceived and, and used. It's part of the success of station based car sharing uh, here in Bremen is because we have drawn it into the public realm and into the public awareness. And these mobility hubs, they sometimes combine public transport, always include bicycle parking, they're always easily accessible and with clear marking. And then they might also include other neighborhood services um, like taxi stands or recycling um, hubs and so on and so forth. But since 2013, we've also been um, working on the strategy of the, the small neighborhood hubs, which means stations of two to three vehicles um, rather than four or more, um, directly where the journey starts. So where the people live in front of their in front of their um, door. So there are smaller stations, but some components are always still the same. It's the branding, it's the accessibility, the clear markings, and the integrated bicycle parking. And you can see maybe here's the concentration. Um, car share stations um, are mainly also mainly concentrated to the city's center, uh, more dense neighborhoods, obviously where there's a higher user case. But in Bremen, one third of, the, of all of the car sharing stations are mobility hubs, so in the public realm. And we're also working on increasing the network density and decreasing the distance between stations to a maximum of 300 meters. So that's a basic planning principle is um, when we're looking at, at sites for new mobility hubs, we look at what is existing and how can we close gaps in the network so that A, all citizens have access and B, that um, the distance to the next station is short, which makes the service most attractive. And obviously, like I already said, the benefits of mobility hubs are is this increased visibility and accessibility of shared and sustainable travel modes. They also allow us to create really tailored solutions um, for each neighborhood. Um, each mobility hub is a specific design for, for the neighborhood and we try and address issues of accessibility, um, barrier-free um, crossings, 
um, additional green space, um, anything. And that results really as a part of the engagement with, with the, the neighborhoods and the elected council members. And obviously the joint branding is not so important for the user, really. Um, they're interested in, in what providers are located there. But the joint branding has really created a lot of visibility and especially political support. Um, so that, for instance, in Bremen, we don't have that discussion anymore at all, if car sharing makes sense. Um, but maybe, you know, about where precisely it should be located. Um, but every single political party now in the meantime is saying, why is this not going faster? Um, I've talked a lot about station-based. Um, we also have a free-floating car sharing offer, but it is part of a combined system. So station-based and free-floating from one provider of one hand, which means that the impact is almost as high as station-based um, itself. Um, there's uh, quite a lot of interesting research and free-floating car sharing on itself hardly has any impact on reducing car ownership. But combined systems that combine both forms of car sharing have a significant impact on reducing car ownership. So that's why we were okay with this offer. And um, just a quick overview of the other um, sharing, shared mobility providers at the moment. Um, we have a few other providers knocking on our door and other modes, but we have three car sharing providers, um, three bike sharing or bike rental providers that also provide cargo bikes. And we have two e-scooter providers. Um, the e-scooter decision and also the same for future e-moped offers was very conscious is to limit the number of providers uh, in our city to two. We also want to limit and have decided to limit the number of vehicles. And then there are rules for, obviously there are no go and no parking zones. There are, um, are rules for how many e-scooters are um, allowed to be parked um, at one location by provider and so on and so forth. And um, other than our, yeah, different from our big sister Hamburg, uh, we've decided to go with a special use permit for all of these providers um, and all of these modes. So Sonnennutzungserlaubnis in German, they all have to provide, um, apply to use the public space. They all have to adhere to specific quality criteria that we've defined for, defined for that space. And they all have to pay to use that space. And it's something that was maybe a bit unpopular with the e-scooter providers, for instance, at the beginning. Um, in the meantime, they also appreciate this approach because it has a positive impact on their image. Um, I'm sure they play by the rules. Um, there is competition, but it's not too much. Um, and we as a city, very clear, we don't want our limited street space flooded with, yeah, unlimited providers and unlimited vehicles. So um, it's an approach that we're, we're quite happy with. And obviously the operational areas um, are also um, defined in, in cooperation with, with us. This is an example of the operational area for um, free-floating um, car sharing providers. And we've consciously excluded our Sinti city center. Um, we have the, the, um, the goal to have a car-free city center by 2030. And we're asking providers to um, respect and plan for that now um, as well. But um, this operational area is very similar for the other free-floating micromobility offers uh, in the city that it obviously concentrates um, around um, highly dense uh, neighborhoods that are um, yeah, less of the outskirts, but more um, closer to the city center. The interesting thing is that while we don't have designated parking bays for shared micro mobility yet, um, it's on the agenda for the future, um, we still find that um, the shared e-scooters kind of are, are magically drawn <laughs> to the existing uh, Mobilpunkte. So by having a mobility hub for, for car sharing, um, users already um, place their vehicles um, there, maybe in, yeah not so ordered ways in, in this picture, but um, they already have a, a regulating effect, um, which is interesting because we hadn't planned it that way yet. But the question is, we've also talked about, um, the question is uh, e-mobility uh, in car sharing. I haven't talked about that a lot um, yet because to be honest, 
any form of shared mobility already brings significantly environmental benefits and behavioral benefits um, compared to individual car ownership. So it doesn't have to be the perfect solution in E for it to ready to have a high, uh, high impact in reducing emissions and reducing car use and car ownership. Kind of what we leave the decision to incorporate e-car sharing up to the providers for a number of reasons. One of them is that in, in Germany, it's still very expensive to purchase an electric vehicle. The expense of fun, uh, financing the charging infrastructure is also a major hurdle for the providers. And it's not something that we can um, or are willing to do as, as a city. Um, in Norway, that's a different case, um, obviously, where um, the purchase of, of EVs is um, cheaper or, or more affordable due to different taxation rules, but in Germany, it's still quite expensive. And since these are self-financing um, companies, we leave it up to them um, to decide which type of vehicle um, they offer um, based on their financial capabilities and the needs of their users. And for example, of the 500 car sharing vehicles in um, Bremen, only 14 of those are electric, um, 10 are hybrid. Um, the car share providers obviously have a goal to increase the, um, the percentage of electric vehicles in the fleet, but it is slow but growing for a number of reasons. And we respect that. Um, another reason is obviously that it's still the user skepsis um, towards EVs. A study from the German Car Sharing Association a few years ago found out that the main hurdle for not using car sharing is that non-users think it's complicated. And integrating an E increases the perceived, when I say perceived, complexity. It's always a, a subjective um, perception and it's complicated. Obviously it's not the case. And once somebody has shown you how to use it, it's quite easy and, and convenient. But um, there's still this user skeptic skepsis um, as well. So, you know, keeping it simple is something that's really important for creating uh, attractive car sharing services and allowing them to grow in the future. What we do um, do as a city is to plan for um, the integration of charging infrastructure to every new mobility hub. So we plan space, we plan, um, um, yeah, the, the underground infrastructure so that the installation of a um, charging pole is, is really easy um, once the financing is there or once the provider has decided to, um, to offer electric vehicles at that site. They can easily be, be retrofitted. So obviously planning for the future and being ready, but also um, respecting provider decisions and, um, and the conditions of the current market. So um, yeah, I'm looking forward to, to all the questions before that, um, though a shameless plug, if I, if I will, for a physical event in three weeks. And I think some of you are already um, registered and we'll see each other there. It's the Shared Mobility Rocks Symposium in Bremen on May 25th. It's also the final conference of the Share North project. And we're really, really looking forward to sharing um, ideas, um, our successes, and we have a lot of really incredible guest speakers. We're expecting about 250 participants. Um, if you're not on the list and are interested, then please come. It's going to be awesome and rocking. Okay. And it's possible and, to attend your yeah, Exactly. Exactly. Well, it's it's different. Both both are rocking in their own way. And um, obviously, final message um, as a city. Uh, communication is really, really important, not only about the policies and impacts, but also recognizing successes uh, and impacts among the users and saying thank you. Like we said, thank you to the over 20,000 car sharing users um, in Bremen. And I'd like to say thank you to you for listening. Thank you so much, Rebecca. Much appreciated. Great overview. And a couple of questions. Uh, as the time is running, let's catch um, maybe a few also. We do, of course, have also tomorrow to dive in deeper. Um, but I see that uh, Rebecca had quite a few.
few questions. Uh, no, sorry. Uh, uh, <laughs> Iris had quite a few questions for Rebecca. Sorry. Um, so maybe if you would like to. Yeah, I would ask like to uh, ask the questions. Yeah. First of all, thank you, Rebecca. It was very interesting. And it's nice to see also the, some projects about car sharing as well, since uh, we are very much into the car sharing. Um, yeah, I think it's better to take the second question then, because I also want to uh, go to the question of Stefan, which I also find very interesting. Uh, but my question was, um, do you measure how many privately owned cars there have been replaced so far by the shared cars? And is this mainly like the first, the second or the third car? Um, and another thing is, can you also see the difference in replacement by free floating compared to station based? Um, yeah, in the 2018 study we did, uh, and which we plan to repeat next year, so roughly every five years we um, plan to, to, to reanalyze. Um, the next analysis um, will include the impact of the free floating um, cars, so hopefully, hopefully by next, uh, next year I'll be able to, to send that to you. Um, but um, we do know um, in the combined system, at least from, from the German Car Sharing Association study where they compared um, cities of Cologne, Stuttgart, um, Frankfurt am Main, um, that all have station-based, free-floating and combined systems, um, that the replacement rate is very similar um, to station-based um, alone of the combined um, system. Um, that, that was actually the whole reason why we said, okay, um, Cambio local car share provider, um, you can try that out here. Um, before we, we were not unhappy that no free-floating provider was interested in putting them. Um, we have um, also yeah, analyzed, we have a, uh, know the replacement quota. Um, our aim is to replace the first car in the household uh, here in, in the city. Um, in smaller cities, obviously the aim can be definitely um, the second or third household, but um, we want to replace um, the first car in the household. Um, and so far around 7,000 privately owned cars have been um, gotten rid of. Um, as a result of using car sharing. So um, in this uh, big campaign poster we did that, that that would be a stretch of road of nearly 35 kilometers um, long of parked cars. Wow, so yeah. that's quite impressive. Thank you. Thanks. Super, great. And maybe also Natalia, you had a couple of questions. Maybe you can also combine them directly. Um, yes, so no, I um, thank you very much for the presentation and um, I, I just was wondering according to to the it's not really car sharing but the pyramid that uh, you showed on the presentation at the beginning, I was surprised to see um, that um, you place uh, micro mobility at the same level than cycling. And the other question was to know if it was possible for you to share some uh, details about the um, psychologic uh, offer that you have because um, well it may be very interesting um yeah the the mobility py pyramid some people are fans of it and and others are are not um essentially um in the in this graphical representation um it's we put the shared micro mobility on the level of of the sh shorter distances um traveled Obviously, that in no way means that um, e-scooters should be used instead of cycling or instead of instead of walking. Um, I think we had a, a discussion about that in the chat uh, a bit earlier as well. Um, but these are, are shared modes that are used for distances that are shorter than, than public transport or as last mile solutions. Um, that's why, at least in that graphical representation, we decided to, to put it there. Um, and your second question was, can you remind me? Uh, yes, the um, psychologic uh, yeah. offer. Um, psychologic is, is a bike sharing provider um, here, but they mostly focus on um, electric cargo bikes um, as well. 
And can you share some details on that? I don't know if, if you're, you know about them or some of your colleagues have them. It's, it's a fairly small startup company. Um, I would say they um, work with our, or, or have their base at um, our technical university um, as well. Um, I know they work together with some housing developers to, to provide uh, mobility concepts, but they are, they are one of, of many, um, exactly, uh, more, I, I, I wouldn't know, know what, what else to say on them. Okay, thank you. Fantastic. Thank you so much. I, I give you also a sneak preview to tomorrow's uh, uh, discussion, because uh, this will continue uh, till tomorrow. Thank you so much, Rebecca. Much appreciated. And also, thank you for sharing the link here. Um, uh, so tomorrow we'll look in more depth. So the time window is the same between 9 and 12. We also take a few breaks um, on integrating shared mobility solutions into the transport system. Um, we'll have several presentations, again, from Hofan, from Tier. Uh, from the Mobimix project, um, uh, uh, from SPB, from eHubs. Um, uh, so uh, more points to follow up and to discuss. Um, again, of course, if you can't make it, of course, it would be very nice if you can. You can still follow uh, uh, the presentations then uh, afterwards. Uh, this will also be uh, recorded and uh, shared then after. So thank you so much for a very dynamic, very uh, interesting uh, morning discussion and see you all hopefully tomorrow morning. Um, it's basically also the same link on the technical side of things. Like.